The Girl Who Lived, Part 1 of 2, a Harry Potter fan fiction written by E.J. Lomax on archive of our own as Dirt Without Music, read by Grant Goodman. They told the story differently. When they spoke in hushed whispers and in exultant shouts that Halloween about the girl who lived, they did not wonder how she survived. They did not ask what hidden strengths of prophecy might lie under her skin. They talked of innocence. They spoke of purity. They murmured about blessings. Harriet Lily Potter was left on the doorstep of Poor Privet Drive. They called her ugly and gave her Dudley's hand-me-downs. They would tell people that she went to a boarding school for troubled young women. Dudley still offered to stick her head in toilets, and she still learned to snap back. Really, Duds? The poor toilets never had anything as nasty as your head down it. It might hurt it. And run. Harry was the kind of girl who came home with scabby knees, who snuck the kitchen shears in the dead of night to snip her dark, messy hair short. She wondered as she curled up in her cupboard if Vernon and Petunia would have loved a niece who was pretty instead of scrappy, who had soft hands and never burned the bacon at breakfast. The story did not go much different. When a giant banked down the door of the little shack on the little rock in the sea, Harry stood her trembling ground. When Hagrid offered her a happy birthday, a cake, a kindness, a hand, a new life, she took it. When Harry stepped into Madame Mulkins, Malfoy ignored her, eyes glazing over. Hagrid bought her an owl, eleven birthdays all wrapped into one. When Harry asked if there was room for her to sit in his compartment on the Hogwarts Express, Ron said yes. She shared her candy. She told him he had a smudge on his nose. When the first years all lined up on the steps, waiting to be let into the hall and the sorting, Ron went so pale all his freckles stood out. Harry shifted next to him, and then a girl with a flat nose, a round chin, and a sure twist to her mouth stepped in front of her and stuck out one bitten nail hand. Parkinson, she said. Pansy Parkinson. What are you doing hanging out with trash like Weasley, Potter? I can show you a better class of wizard. Harry curled her hands softly in her robes, still feeling like she was wearing a bathrobe and not real clothes. I think I can figure out just fine by myself, thank you. The story did not go much different. When the hat called Potter, Harriet, the hall went quiet, then filled with murmurs. It offered her Slytherin, but she thought of Parkinson's sneer, of Ron's smudged nose on the train, the way Molly had helped her through the platform entrance, and told it no. Then better be Gryffindor, it said, and the red and gold table burst into noise. There were five beds in the first-year girls' dormitory in Gryffindor Tower. Vavati Patil and Lavender Brown, both from good wizarding families, bonded immediately over Lavender's sparkly purple nail polish. Hermione's hair was as bushy as Harry's was a rumpled mess. You could keep birds in there, Pavati giggled to Lavender. Nevi Longbottom was short, with rounded shoulders, rounded cheeks, plain brown hair. Her grandmother expected her to be good, but not brave. When the hat had fallen over a young Miss Longbottom's eyes, it had sat even longer on her head, arguing silently with her small, clenched fists. Hat stall, Ron had told Harry sagely in line, just as the hat shouted out, Gryffindor. Is your name short for something? Hermione demanded upon first introduction, as all the first years following Percy Weasley up to the tower, the girls clustered in the back. It sounds short for something. Nevy went a slightly miserable red. No, she said. When they reached the dormitory proper, the first thing Nevy did was tuck Trevor the toad's shoebox safely under her bed. When Draco Malfoy stole Nevy's remember-all, Harry hopped on a broom. When McGonagall saw her snatch the tiny, glinting ball from the air, she dragged her off not to detention, but to wood, and a new era of the Gryffindor Quidditch team. Fred and George tracked her down to give her a congratulations and a pair of twinned grins, but at dinner time the chasers swooped down on their newest team member, Angelina Johnson, Katie Bell, and Alicia Spinnett. Oh my god, you're adorable, said Alicia. I want to ruffle your hair. Can I ruffle your hair? It's not going to make it worse, said Harry. When Draco challenged Ron to a duel, Harry jumped in as a second as soon as someone explained the concept to her. Pansy, sneering still, always sneering, her face was going to stick like that, cornered Draco and made him kick Crab out as a second and take her on instead. It was a trap, anyway, and Harry and co. just ended up running into a three-headed dog while running from Filch, but Pansy cared about the details of things. 
when a troll got into the dungeons. Harry overheard Pravati and Lavender talking about Hermione crying in the bathrooms. She peeled off the back of the group to find her, Ron grumbling and loyally at her heels. The story did not go much different, except when a dragon was born in Hagrid's fireplace, it was Pansy who peeked through the windows, and Pansy who earned her own detention by catching them after hours without Harry's invisibility cloak. The story didn't go much different, except Hermione stayed up late studying, reading beneath the covers by light of a lumos, chewing on the ends of the ballpoint pens she had brought from home, and only took out behind the closed doors of their dormitory room. Lavender curled up on Pavati's four-poster, and they painted each other's toes. It turned out Nevi could do these tiny, beautiful flowers picked out in nail polish, so they invited her up, too. When the Yule Ball came, three years from those awkward first few weeks, Nevi wouldn't practice her dance steps with an invisible partner. Hermione would enchant music to play and read her books, while Lavender spun Nevi round and round their cluttered floor, leaping askew cauldrons and piles of scarves. When they figured out about the Sorcerer's Stone, they guessed wrong about Snape. They guessed wrong about Quirrell. Lavender and Pavati slept through the whispered argument Hermione and Harry had with Nevi, and the Petrificus Totalis that left her rigid in bed. They met up with Ron in the common room, and headed to the forbidden third-floor corridor three eleven-year-olds out to save their little part of the world. Fluffy was already charmed. Ron hollered, are you a witch or not? And Hermione set the world alight. Harry flew. Ron beat the chess game. Hermione beat the riddle. And Harry stepped through cold flames. When she looked in the mirror, Vera said, she saw herself slipping the stone in her pocket because all she wanted to do was find it. The story did not go much different. Harry had her father's hair, her mother's eyes, and all their love. When Quirrell reached out to touch her, he burned. She woke up to a quiet infirmary, Albus Dumbledore's smiling old face, and a table piled high with sweets, and a toilet seat. Thank you, Weasleys. The story did not go much different, except that when Ron, his brothers, and his father's flying car rescued Harry from a locked, barred bedroom that next summer, Mrs. Weasley hugged her warmly. That was the same, tutted over her short, unladylike hair, and had her sleep on Ginny's floor instead of Ron's. Um, said Harry from under her quilt on the floor, as the muffled sounds of thrilled panic hadn't faded a good twenty minutes after Molly'd flicked the lights off. Are you okay up there? You're Harriet Potter, Ginny whispered. You defeated you know who. Ah, uh, said Harry. I was a baby. I don't think I really did much. Ginny was still hyperventilating a little bit, so Harry said slowly, So how about those Chudley cannons? Harpies, said Ginny promptly, still a little breathless, voice squeaky and certain. Ron's the only one fool enough to root for the cannons. Harry tucked her blankets more firmly around herself. So you like Quidditch then? I'm going to be on the house team, Ginny said, the words still in a rush. You play? Ron didn't mention. There was a long silence. Well, said Ginny quietly, don't tell, okay? The boys aren't good about letting me play with them, so I sneak out some nights to the broom shed and borrow their brooms. Borrow, said Harry. Well, Ginny said, I put them back after. There was another silence. Then she said, I'm good too, and I'm going to get better. Harry smiled up at the dark ceiling. Hope you don't want to be seeker then, she said. I'd hate the competition. No, I like playing chaser, she said. Seeker's sort of lonely, don't you think? Huh, Harry said. I hadn't thought about it. Well, said Ginny, voice going drowsy in the small, dark room. And what if I don't get into Gryffindor? Ginny got into Gryffindor. A whole block of Weasley Red, plus Harry and Hermione, stood up and cheered. They called Harry the heiress of Slytherin, and Pansy rolled her eyes. At dueling club, Harry urged a snake away from Ernie, and the whispers grew louder. She was twelve years old. People had been hissing things at her all her life, crueler things than this, and louder, and at home. Harry got her first period on an unremarkable Wednesday, in the fall of that second year, and didn't know why there was blood on her sheets. She cleaned up, bundling the sheets at the foot of her mattress, breathing shallowly, thinking about dying, thinking about bleeding out, thinking about how she'd ruined the bedding forever and how they were going to punish her for it. Then Hermione woke up, took in the situation, and dug through her dresser for pads, 
while she explained that no one was dying. Did your aunt and uncle never give you any books about this kind of thing? The story did not go much different, except that when Ginny started fading, Harry noticed. When Ginny tried to say something, and Percy, terrified it was his own embarrassing secrets on her tongue, shushed her, Harry followed her up to the first-year girl's dormitory. Ginny stared back at her, tiny and pale and tongue-tied, so Harry said, Want to go flying? Madam Hooch has got spare brooms. Ginny's hands were as freckled as the rest of her, and they had been shaking on her quills for weeks, skewing her handwriting. Her hair, which was normally a little bit of a mess, was perfectly brushed, because Ginny kept waking up too early in the morning, with nothing else to do. They found Mrs Norris frozen, tied up by her tail. They found Ernie Macmillan and nearly headless Nick. They found Colin Creevy, frozen behind his camera. It took three stilted trips to the empty Quidditch pitch before Ginny, lying on her back in the grass beside Harry, said haltingly, There's this book, a diary. It didn't go that different. Harry went to find a teacher, and Ginny went to find Tom Riddle's diary, but his strength was already simmering in her blood, the fibres of her muscles, her bones. This fragment of Tom Riddle still had tricks up his sleeve, and he was so determined not to die again. They found it written in red paint on the floor of the first-year Gryffindor girl's dorm. Her skeleton will lie in the chamber forever. Harry told McGonagall the shape of it, everything she knew. They still decided to close the school. They still didn't know where the chamber was. They still huddled, scared, in corridors. Ron still went pale as snow, freckles standing out stark. McGonagall drafted apologies in her head, trying to figure out how she would tell Molly and Arthur about their youngest. It didn't go that different. Hermione, unfrozen still, guessed about the bathroom entrance and the basilisk. She, Ron and Harry went down, dragging a reluctant Lockhart behind them. Lockhart turned on them with Ron's broken wand. Old and unstable, the walls of the entrance tunnel tumbled down, and Harry went on alone, gripping her wand, pushing her bangs back out of her eyes. It went the same, a lump of sodden black robes and a red hair discarded on the chamber floor, but still breathing. A snake, a bird, a fang driven through empty pages, ink pooling like from a wound, tears, and a flight up and homeward. It went different. When Ginny woke up in soft, warm sheets in the infirmary, she knew someone had believed her. Someone had come for her. Someone had listened. The next summer went the same, except that when Fudge found Harry in Diagon Alley, he tuttered additionally about a girl out all alone. When Lupin woke on the Hogwarts Express, he still, for a terrible split second, saw James, messy-haired and thirteen and breathing. But Lupin still said, Harry, didn't say anything about her mother's eyes or her father's friendship, just offered her some chocolate. Dementors ringed the Hogwarts grounds, and they still sent the same debilitating chill into Harry's sternum. They came to the Quidditch match and sent her slamming into the hard ground, saved only by the lifting spells of spectators. She went to Lupin's office to ask about Patronuses, because she could handle her world going dark, her ears filling with her parents' last words, but they couldn't take Quidditch from her. She couldn't bear that. Harry had her mother's eyes. In every world, Harry had her mother's eyes. Lupin didn't tell her so, but he sat there in his office and remembered how very badly Lily had wanted not to be afraid. He remembered how much James had loved to fly. But James had liked it when people watched, and Lupin didn't think this young woman did. You look just like your mother, people told Harry. Strangers told her, and teachers, and parents, and people who she might have known if she had gotten to grow up calling Godric's hollow home. You look just like your mother, they said, except for the hair, of course. Harry felt like people were passing through her body, taking bits and pieces and putting them on display. Here, the eyes that belonged to her mother and not to her. Here, the hair that was messy just like her dad's. Here, the scar their murderer had left on her face. Harry scowled through divination. Livenda and Pravati hung star charts up all over the dorm room and read each other's tea leaves in the morning, while Hermione simmered and snapped. They told Harry she couldn't go to Hogsmeade. They didn't tell her why. She had lived before with bars on her windows, until Ron and the twins and their father's car had yanked them off and flown her away. They saved her again here, with the map, but before that she stomped downstairs to the Gryffindor common room, 
Second years weren't allowed to go to Hogsmeade either. Come on, she said to Ginny. Let's go flying. I'm going to snap if I don't get some air. Scabbers vanished, leaving just a few ginger hairs and blood drops on Ron's sheets. He and Hermione didn't speak for weeks, until Hermione found Scabbers in a milk jug at Hagrid's, and a big black dog dragged Ron off by the leg when he wouldn't drop the rat. Harry and Hermione followed. The dog became serious, the escaped mass murderer. Remus arrived. There were reunions, confusions. Everything settled down, just a bit, and then Snape shoved through the door. Sometimes, when Snape looked at Harry, he saw Lily's eyes. Other times, it was just James's mess of hair, his surety and his disdain. Sometimes he looked and all he could see was that night, the baby shrieking, unheard, a lump of red hair strewn on the nursery carpet. But in the company of Sirius Black and Remus Lupin, in the shrieking shack, spinning lies, Severus saw James's skinny, arrogant ghost. In the years of the war before James died, they had been on different sides. Severus was Dumbledore's, bought and paid for. It was Lily's, whether or not she had wanted him. But here in this old shack, he was a kid drunk on the power to finally bring his old bullies to justice. But Harriet Potter was thirteen years old, and she was not her father, not her mother, not anyone's ghost. She was not here for Snape, for Sirius, for Lupin's story. She was here because her omen had dragged Ron off into a nightmare house, and she intended to get him back. Snape went down under joint expelliarmuses, and then Harry and Hermione turned to Sirius and Remus. They pulled stories out of the men, young men still. At thirteen, the kids would not have called them young, but they were. Sirius's face was gaunt, hollow, masked. Remus's was lined and scarred with hurts and sorrows. They did not look their age, but neither did Harry, as she stood there, unshaking, between their rage and Peter's life, demanding mercy. She didn't know what her father would have done here. She didn't know what curses her mother would have spat. But she told them, my dad wouldn't have wanted to see his two best friends turn murderers, not for him. Ron perched on the bed, white with pain. Hermione hovered, her wand ready, the brightest witch of her age. Harry could imagine them hollow-cheeked, gaunt, scarred. She could imagine them this full of justified rage, raising their wands in anger. She could imagine them doing it in her name, and she didn't want it. Harry had her father's messy hair, her mother's eyes, and the last of the marauders listened. It didn't go that much different. The moon rose, as moons do. Remus changed. Peter shifted and ran. The Dementors came. Harry thought she could see her father on the far shore, a bright white shape rushing toward her as everything went dark. It didn't go that different. It rarely does with time travel. Hermione spun the time turner three times. They set two innocent lives free. Harry stood on the shore of the lake, quietly burying her parents again in her heart, and calling her full Patronus, a stag with blazing silver antlers, prongs, the ghost of James Potter, the shield of his daughter. Hermione held her hand while the Dementors dissipated, fled. Then they went back to the infirmary to sit with the sleeping Ron and eat chocolate until Madame Pomfrey made them go to sleep themselves. Sirius sent Harry a letter on the train ride home, carried by a tiny owl he said for her to give to Ron, since he deprived him of his pet rat. They let Ginny name the creature, and she chose Pidgewidgeon. When the Quidditch World Cup came the summer before their fourth year, the Weasleys got an extra ticket each for Hermione and Harry. The girls slept on the carpeted floor of Ginny's room, well, slept eventually, after Hermione threatened to cast an underage silencio spell if Harry and Ginny didn't shut up about the Ireland's team's chases at three in the morning. When Cedric Diggory strode his broad shoulders out to the portkey that next morning, Hermione and Ginny blushed just a little. Harry jogged up the hill behind Ginny's swirl of red hair, chattering about the broom capacities on each team. When the Death Eaters came to the cup, Arthur told them to run, and they did. When a fourth champion came out of the goblet, Dumbledore did not ask if she had put her name in. Faced with dragons, Harry summoned a broom and flew. The magic wood under her hands felt like cheating, felt stolen, but the crowd was screaming. Hermione was breathless with it, Ron whooping, Ginny rocketing to her feet to shout. Faced with water, Harry wasn't sure what to do, until Nevy poked her head shyly through her four-poster hangings 
and told her about Jillyweed. When Harry saw Fleur's little sister Gabrielle floating, pale and waterlogged, in the lake, she cut her free. When they reached land, Fleur wrapped her sister in her arms and dry towels. She kissed Harry's cheek and offered to show her how to do something nice with her hair. The school halls began to buzz about the Yule Ball, so Harry started squinting around. She looked at Dean's jawline. She eyed Seamus's forearms. She squinted at Ron's freckled cheekbones, curious, and nothing happened. But Cho Chang had a quiet little giggle she hid behind her hands. Cho carried her books on her left arm so she could push her straight black hair out of her face with her right. She had a butterfly sketched onto her charm's notebook. When Harry faced off against Ravenclaw, staring down the other seeker, Cho looked so serious that Harry could barely recognise her as the softly smiling girl from the Great Hall. The stony, eagle-eyed patience made her no less pretty, and Harry flushed all over. She still managed to get the snitch, but it was a hard-won struggle against distraction, especially when Cho outraced her and let out a laugh into the thin air. I think, Harry whispered that night to Hermione, both curled up inside the muffling curtains of her four-poster, I think I might be gay. It was a moment of quiet, and then Hermione threw the four-poster curtains back. Grab your cloak, she said, glancing around quickly to check that the other girls were sleeping or occupied. Parvati glanced up from Quidditch through the ages, then looked back down. We've got to go to the library. What? said Harry, snatching up the bundle of the cloak and following Hermione down the twisting Gryffindor Tower stairs. Why? I don't know anything about that, Hermione said shrilly. How am I supposed to be a good friend? How am I... What am I supposed to do? To say? I don't want to get it wrong, Harry. Harry snatched at her sleeve and pulled her to a stop, partway down the stair from the girl's dorm. Hermione, you're not going to get it wrong. Hermione took a shaky breath. It's important, Harry, she said. You're important. See? You're doing okay. Harry was grinning a little now, as Hermione's lip wobbled. Harry moved a step down and squeezed Hermione's hands. So, Herm... I think I'm gay. Hermione squeezed back. Okay, she said. That's, um, neat. Do you want to talk about it? Not really, said Harry. I just wanted to say it. Yule Ball shenanigans continued, and Ron dropped his chin glumly onto his hands at the breakfast table. They run in packs. Seriously, said Harry. She dropped her chin on her hands, too, and added glumly. Cho's going with Cedric. I heard at breakfast. She had told Ron about her crush, and Ron had said, Cool. Hey, you want to play a game of chess? I've got those twelve inches on unicorn hair harvesting practices to do for Snape, but I don't want to. Harry went on. And even if she wasn't. I'd say take me, as a statement, Hermione said briskly, and then stopped, blushing. But someone already asked me. Did they now? said Harry, straightening and grinning at her. Do tell. Do tell, said Ron. I'm... Hermione flushed. Come on, said Harry. So long as it's not Malfoy, we're not going to laugh. Ron pushed his eggs around his plate. Hermione did not tell, even when Harry pestered her all up the Gryffindor girl's stare that night. Is it Pansy? Tell me it's not Pansy. No, it's Crab, isn't it? Just admit it. Nevi practiced the dance steps with Lavender and Pavati, all three of them twirling around the dorm room and taking turns playing the boys. Harry tried to prepare for the next task, or Hermione tried to get her to prepare for the next task, but Lavender hauled them to their feet and spun them across the cluttered floor. Harry tripped over her feet until Pavati started explaining the concepts in Quidditch metaphors. Rita Skeeter wrote stories about Harry, her glistening, tear-filled eyes, her torrid romances with her fellow champions. Skeeter wrote articles about Ron, in which she clearly thought long and hard about whether or not gold digger was a gender-neutral word. Ron received howlers from his mother, and Harry received a parcel for Easter, a tenth the size of Hermione's. Hermione shared. Ginny, who had also received full-sized parcel, grinned at Harry and did not share. The costs of fame, she said through a mouthful of chocolate frog. Ginny was too young to go to the ball, so she bullied Seamus Finnegan into taking her. Harry was told he was not allowed to go stag, as a champion, and so she scowled and scowled and asked Ron. As bros, she told Ron, and he nodded solemnly. The girls' dorm got ready together, Pravati braiding Lavender's hair and Lavender helping them all with makeup. Ginny snuck in too, 
hands curled in the skirts of her hand-me-down dress robes. She sat on Harry's bed, cross-legged, and brushed her hair out in long, even strokes, while she laughed at Harry's inability to sit still under Lavender's ministrations. I don't know what to do about your hair, Pavati said apologetically, but Harry told her Fleur had already offered to help. Ron and Harry did the opening dance, with Ron rolling his eyes every time Harry's eyes drifted over to Cho's graceful steps, to Cedric's hand low on her back. Pitiful, he told her, and Harry glanced pointedly at Crumb's hand on Hermione's waist. Shut up, said Ron. Didn't say anything, said Harry. She's consorting with the enemy, said Ron, as the other couples took to the floor. Harry saw Nevy dancing with Dean, deep in concentration. Lavender with Anthony Goldstein, Seamus dancing with Ginny, her long, shining hair twirling out around her. Ron went to look for Punch, and Harry let Dean steal her, then only Macmillan, who still hadn't stopped making awkward apologies about thinking she was evil in their second year, then a Durmstrung boy whose name Harry never actually learned. You were very brave with the dragons, he told her, hand warm and sweaty in hers. You fly well. Ginny and Harry ended up talking Quidditch in the corner with Pavati, getting stolen by Durmstrung boys in rapid succession, but always returning to that same corner of askew chairs. Finally, Ginny grabbed Harry's hand after yet another strapping lad and his fur-lined robe had stolen Pavati away and said, Let's go for a walk. I want to finish talking about Ronsky faint tactics before another beautiful example of the male species distracts us. Unless it's Crumb, said Harry. I bet he'd talk Ronsky faints with us. Crumb, said Ginny, is busy. Hermione was jumping around on the dance floor. Ron was sitting, scowling by the punch. Ginny fetched them both glasses for their walk, said something teasingly to Ron, but didn't invite him to come along. Hermione was giggly and flushed when they made it back to their rooms that night. Harry was still full of the dark, still peace of the gardens, the way Ginny's gesturing hands had cut through cold air. Nevy hummed dancing music as she awkwardly wiped makeup from her smiling face. Harry went to sleep to Lavender and Pavati's whispered, giggling recollections, and woke up to the last triwizard task, still looming in the distance. Faced with the maze, Harry had three years of surviving magic and danger no child should ever have had to face. She had three years of lessons, too, of practice with Hermione and Ron in empty classrooms, but that was what saved her. She had looked death in the eye before, and not died. This was a story being written about her. She could not die. Cedric never got the chance to look it in the eye at all. Wormtongue looked at her and saw Lily, but he helped lash her to the gravestone all the same. He stepped over Cedric's body. Peter sliced a long red cut down Harry's forearm, and he brought Voldemort back to a full, twisted life. Peter Pettigrew had not seen James and Lily die, but he had imagined it over the almost two decades since their death. He imagined it had looked something like this, like this bruised sprawl of young limbs, this mess of dark hair, those green eyes flashing, fearful and furious. Peter had not thought of them as young then. He thought of himself as old, now. But he had cut off his hand for Tom Riddle, for fear, for his life. He could cut out his heart, too. Harry got away with the help of her ghosts. She had their hair, their eyes, their love. She had Cedric's body, and she brought it with her because he had asked her to. She crashed down onto the overgrown Quidditch pitch, onto knees that hadn't been scabbed for years. He's back, she said. She said it again and again, and no one believed her. End of part one of two. This has been a reading of a fanfiction creation by E. Jade Lomax, with music by Maiden.